<laughs> Hello, real participants. Welcome to the second meeting of Rethinking Eurasia Lecture Series 2020. How are you today? Hope you are feeling well. My name is Sursaya, and I'm going to be the moderator of the first session talk. Before starting the session, I would like to remind all of the participants to change your username, the format of P, and then your full name. Also, don't forget to mute your microphone during the session. Today, we are delighted to have Dr. Pratiwirat Noningya from Universitas Negeri Surabaya, who will be discussing about literacy and identity in Indonesian domestic workers, social media exchangement. Before we start the lecture, I want to give a brief introduction about Dr. Pratiwi. So, Pratiwi Ratnamitya is a lecturer of English at the, department, at the English Department, University of Negeri Surabaya, Surabaya City, Indonesia. She earned two master's degree, the first in American Studies from Gajah Mada University, Jakarta, Indonesia, and the second in Literature from Texas State University, San Marcos, USA. She holds a PhD in Cultural Studies from the University of Melbourne, Australia. Since 2004, she has been in various teacher professional development programs at the national level and is currently with the School Literacy Movement Task Force under the coordination of the Directorate of Primary and Secondary Education Ministry of Education and Culture. So, Without further ado, I'd like to invite Dr. Pratwirat Noningtia to deliver the talk on literacy and IDD Indonesia domestic workers social media engagement. So Dr. Pratwi, the time is yours. Okay, thank you very much for a very nice introduction. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I'm so excited um, to have the opportunity to share uh, a little that I know about uh, literacy in relation to uh, identity. Um, but Ursia, if, if you may uh, just give me a brief info about the audience. But Ursia? Yes? Yeah, if you could just give me a brief info about uh, the audience. Oh, but uh, the audience is from they are from University Negeri Malang and some are from another universities okay. in Indonesia. Okay, thank you very, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so just a brief introduction of uh, what, what I'm going uh, to share um, uh, very shortly. Um, so my uh, current research interest is in uh, literacy, but uh, from more or less a different perspective. Yeah, we usually uh, think of literacy as related to the ability to read uh, and write. We uh, usually define literacy as a set of skills, yeah, especially reading and writing. And I'm pretty sure uh, since most of us uh, are from English uh, department as our educational background, Literacy is not something new to us, yeah. But uh, in in my talk, I'm going to share something that might be uh, new, uh, quite unique, because we see literacy as a social practice. Yeah. So allow me to share the screen. Okay, uh, so can you see the PowerPoint all right? I gave uh, this title to my uh, presentation, Literacy, Identity and Modernity. And I'm using uh, two cases of Indonesian domestic workers and how they engage in a social network site, uh, particularly uh, Facebook, yeah. Uh, for those who may uh, not be familiar with what, uh, how we see that the lives of Indonesian domestic workers in Hong Kong and also Taiwan can actually be related to literacy. Yeah? Uh, a very common question that I usually get from colleagues or from uh, people uh, is usually, you know, this, this uh, question. So domestic workers? They are writers. Do they publish books? 
they are bloggers, how do they even have a time have time to to manage uh, their time to write? Because uh, as you see in this picture, uh, domestic workers or housemates, um, asisten rumah tangga, they have to struggle to manage their time, yeah, because uh, they have to be multitasking, yeah. Uh, so that kind of stereotype still exists, yeah. The the idea that these domestic workers want uh, to do through literacy practices is actually to break this negative stereotype, yeah. So I'm using this picture. I I love. Uh, uh, beginning my presentation on domestic workers by using this uh, picture, yeah, because it, it shows a kind of identity transformation from uh, being a housemaid or domestic worker to becoming uh, a creative person, in this case, in the form of uh, blogging and also uh, creative writing. This, uh, the picture on the right is uh, the picture of Riri, a uh, domestic worker from uh, from Blora, and this is this is her blog, www.babungablog.blogspot.com. Uh, uh, even the name of the blog itself is really intriguing. It's really uh, provo uh, provocative. Yeah, Babu blog. It's it's a kind of uh, reverse discourse actually. Yeah, how can this word Babu? Yeah, which is which usually has a kind of pejorative meaning, a very um, low meaning um, of somebody who is powerless. But the word in a blog shows that the person, uh, somebody who goes blogging, actually has power uh, by voicing their thoughts uh, in public through uh, blogs. So the picture on the left, a multitasking day-to-day. Uh, uh, life to uh, a creative person. And if you take a look at the picture uh, in uh, more details, if you look at this more carefully, there is actually another person uh, at the back, yeah, at uh, Riri's back. It's actually uh, her her friend who is holding a duster, yeah, a Sula. Uh, and also you see that on her right, Riri is holding a, a camera. And then on the left, we have uh, a laptop. These multiple gadgets, uh, these multiple devices, show that this is one representation of uh, Indonesian domestic workers' lives, yeah? not only in Hong Kong, but also uh, in Taiwan. So uh, the objective of um, this work in progress it's actually um, a study that is not finished yeah i'm still at the uh, stage of collecting and analyzing preliminary uh, data and i've i've already had uh, very interesting findings but this is also uh, based on my phd thesis yeah in my phd thesis i wrote about uh, domestic workers literacy practices in relation to uh, several forms of uh, modernity. Yeah? So uh, basically, I'm, I'm using the same uh, theories, the same concepts, the same approach, but uh, I'm, I'm using different cases. Yeah? I no longer use um, the same uh, participants, yeah? although I already know them uh, quite well. So the idea of my uh, study here is to understand the significance of Indonesian domestic workers' digital literacy practices as their attempts to modernize uh, themselves, yeah. But what I mean by modernization is actually uh, not not a singular meaning of modern modernization in a way that we uh, we when we see people becoming more technologically savvy, then the person becomes sort of westernized. This is a different thing. This is a different definition of uh, modernity, yeah. So we call this self-modernization project through digital literacy practices. And this is also a version of hybrid modernity, the conventional meaning of modernity, yeah, and also their own meaning of uh, modernity. Uh, so what do I mean by uh, self-modernization projects uh, done by Indonesian domestic workers here? Um, they modernize themselves 
by establishing a new identity, yeah, they transform their identity from being a mere domestic worker to uh, writers, bloggers, literacy activists, and also entrepreneurs. But what is interesting here is that the new identity as writers, literacy activists, or entrepreneurs actually carries some elements of the conventional modernity. Yeah? If we refer to Habermas theory or maybe Heber, uh, Weber's theory, we could say that a particular society is modern when technology exists, yeah? when technology is used by the majority of uh, the people in the society. So there is the presence of technology and also the participation in the public sphere. Yeah? It's not only about being visible in the public space, but to be able to actively participate in the discussion in the public forum. But here we talk about women's uh, participation, yeah, which makes it even more interesting yeah, because Habermas actually does not address the involvement of women in the public sphere. Another uh, interesting thing that, that I would like to point out here is that when domestic workers are constructing this new identity, it doesn't mean that they, uh, what is it? They, they, they try to avoid showing to public that they are actually domestic workers, yeah? In fact, they acknowledge this identity. They proudly say that, yes, I am a domestic worker, but I'm also a writer, I'm also a blogger, I'm also a social political activist. So this is also a kind of hybrid identity, yeah? embracing new identity while at the same time holding on to their old identity as a, a domestic worker. Uh, there are actually several case studies that I've been uh, observing uh, very consistently. Uh, for example, how domestic workers practice creative writing, how uh, domestic workers become uh, literacy sponsors by encouraging their fellow domestic workers to read. But in this case, I'm just focusing on their engagement in social media networking, especially uh, Facebook. The question here is, what do they use Facebook for? Yeah, They use it for identity uh, construction. A little bit of a background about transnational um, labor migration, yeah. I think we are already familiar with uh, sort of a negative uh, perception of domestic workers. On one side, we know that domestic workers are considered the heroes of remittance, uh, pahlawan devisa, but in reality, yeah, they are actually confined in, their, ah. in the places that uh, where they work. This is the statistics that we have uh, in 2019. So by countries, we see here that most domestic workers from Indonesia work in Malaysia. Yeah? And then this list is followed by Taiwan and Hong Kong and then Singapore, Saudi Arabia, South Korea, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah? But uh, in my case, uh, we are going to have two uh, domestic workers uh, from Taiwan and uh, Hong Kong. Um, hopefully you could see this all right, uh, but um, I'll just focus on uh, one uh, figure there, one number. If we talk about the origin and destination of international migrants, yeah, uh, this is the statistics that uh, we could see from the UN uh, Women Report in 2019. Uh, here, we see that more than 50% of migrants or migrant workers from Indonesia are actually females. Yeah? Once again, more than 50% of migrant workers from Indonesia are females. Uh, on the other side, it's actually um, a, a, good, a good thing or a good uh, progress because in, when I was conducting my research in 2012 up to 2015, when I was conduct, uh, collecting the data, 
the percentage of uh, female migrant workers from Indonesia were actually 80%. Yeah, 80% of migrant workers were females, and many of them were not skilled. Yeah, but this uh, percentage is is uh, decreasing. I don't really know the answer, but uh, my my assumption is the labor regulation in Indonesia is getting uh, better. It's it's more. Uh, friendly to uh, migrant workers. Now, uh, in the statistics, we see that the receiving countries of Indonesian migrant domestic workers are Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea, and the Gulf nations. Uh, when we talk about domestic workers, yeah, uh, those who work as housemates, they actually play a very significant role in the household. Uh, not only in the receiving countries, not only in the house of their employers, but also in their own houses in Indonesia. Yeah, so they play a very significant role uh, to manage uh, or to make sure that the economy of their family or the employer's family is, uh, you know, moving on the right track, both in sending and receiving countries. Many of them work as live-in domestic workers, meaning that they stay uh, together in the same house uh, as their employers. But many Indonesian domestic workers who work in Hong Kong and uh, Taiwan especially, also work as uh, aged uh, carers. A very interesting uh, research uh, conducted by Fei Chialan, a sociologist from Taiwan, uh, in her book, Global Cinderella's, Pei Chialan refers to these women, not only from Indonesia, but also from the Philippines, as global Cinderella's in this interesting. Yeah? They go overseas, they go abroad to, uh, to make a betterment of their lives for upward social mobility. But on the other hand, they live as they, they live like Cinderella's. They are confined. Uh, they are constrained in space and time. They cannot go outside uh, as, as much as they want. So they are confined in private houses in the sending countries. In the Indonesian context, as I mentioned previously, domestic workers are known as pahlawan devisa, remittance heroes for the countries and for the country and also for the families. However, when it comes to labor regulation, they are still discriminated up to now. Yeah? And we can see this, we can trace this from uh, the works written and also produced by uh, domestic workers. So what do we know about foreign domestic workers' working condition? Yeah, there's, there's been a bunch of our studies about domestic workers, uh, those who come from the Philippines and also from Indonesia. And to be honest, the condition is not really fortunate. Yeah, it's, it's not really satisfying. Uh, most studies, as, uh, as in this case, I mentioned Lofgren uh, studies and also Brenda Yo and uh, Huang in Singapore, they uh, argued that live-in domestic workers were excluded from uh, labor regulations of the receiving countries. They are isolated, they are not visible from the public eye, and they are considered um, belonging to a very low social status. Common cases that uh, happen to them, that they experience, they are underpaid, especially if this is the first time for them to to work as a domestic worker, that usually there is a violation of work contract. Yeah? Maybe because they are not yet literate uh, when, when they read the work contract. Um, and yeah, the, the working condition is also uh, quite poor. If you are in interested to know more about this, you can, you can take a look at uh, Riri's uh, blogs. Uh, she wrote a lot, a lot about uh, the poor working condition. However, that is not what I would like to talk about in, uh, in my presentation. Yeah? I'm not going to talk about the unfortunate lives of domestic workers. Instead, I'd like to see the 
uh, what I said, the, 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 not really the bright sides, but the, the more positive sides of domestic workers, how they uh, fill their uh, daily lives, especially during the days mm -hmm. off by uh, engaging in a number of creative practices yeah, in relation to literacy. So with that in mind, I'm using this uh, concept. I just, I'm just trying to make this uh, um, uh, simple to understand. The way no literacy studies uh, looks at literacy is that we don't see literacy as a kind of assessment. Yeah, For example, we don't talk about literacy in terms of PISA or uh, Ujian Nacional or uh, maybe the the NASH, uh, the what is it, AKM, assessment competency, competency minimum, but we look at what people do with literacy in their daily lives. In fact, right now, we are having a webinar series and I'm presenting the, uh, the rest uh, are listening. This is also an example of literacy event, yeah, because it is observable. But what is interesting about literacy practices is that behind what is observable, there are actually a number of values, perceptions, feelings, beliefs that are embedded in the literacy event. For example, if I ask Mbak Lely and also Mbak Ursia, yeah, what is the reason, what is your reason to join this webinar? Yeah? But Lely and Mbak Ursia might answer this question, well, I'm part of the committee, yeah? So in this case, this is the value that they have, yeah? I like to get new knowledge, but also because it's my responsibility as part of the committee to attend the webinar. Some other people might be interested in joining this webinar for different reasons, yeah? In, for example, in, in our case uh, at UNESA, we also know, we are also aware of some uh, participants who join webinars, not really because of the knowledge, but because they want to get the certificate. Yeah. We have to accept this fact, but from the perspective of new literacy study, it's, it's actually a literacy event. Yeah? That is also literacy practice. People have different roles. People have different reasons to learn something new. Yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'm not going to talk about Bourdieu's uh, theory. Uh, uh, we will just take a look at this from the cases. Now, what can we see from domestic workers' digital literacy practices through social media networking? I'm going to talk about this from two um, different uh, explanations. Facebook is used for identity construction and it is also used for social and also political activism. And these two activities are mediated by technology. Yeah. So for identity construction, the domestic workers use Facebook for self-presentation. I think everybody who has Facebook account uh, more or less use, uh, you know, everybody uses Facebook to present ourselves uh, online. Yeah? Although the online presentation of ourselves might be different from the real self. Yeah? We always want to show you know, the good sides uh, on Facebook. Now, let me introduce you to uh, one of my participants, Epi uh, Juwita, this is her uh, pen name. Epi Juwita uh, actually is from Malang. Um, she was my research participant when I was uh, doing my uh, PhD, but up to now we are still in close contact. Uh, and there is a very interesting case that I uh, observed uh, from, from her literacy practices. Now, so knowing a little bit about Epi Juwita, she worked as a domestic worker uh, earlier in Singapore and Hong Kong from 2000 to 2009. So, she spent uh, almost nine years there yeah, to work as a domestic uh, worker. And then after uh, finishing her contract permanently, she returned to Malang. And then she uh, studied at a private university in Malang. And she, in fact, graduated from the English department of that private uh, university. 
not really far from uh, from UM. Yeah, I I when I was uh, conducting my research in 2012 and 13, I actually visited her when she just finished her class. Yeah, in one in one morning. Uh, so she has a college degree yeah, in English. I asked her what she wrote for her scripts. She wrote about idioms in MIB, Men in Black uh, 3. Yeah? So that is really interesting. Yeah? She, she took linguistics. But what is interesting is that aside from the fact that she holds a bachelor's degree, she is now working again as a domestic worker in Taiwan. Yeah. So you, you might uh, have this question now. Oh, why on earth did he did she decide to, to work as a domestic worker? Can she uh, find a better job with her college degree? Yeah, let's see uh, what uh, she has on her Facebook account and so and also what she uh, has, what she told me in the interview. Everyone, Etsy is not just an ordinary woman. Yeah, I'm not just saying uh, I'm not just referring to her as as a domestic worker, but also as as a woman. I'm a great admirer of, of her and also her works. Uh, these two are some of the works that uh, I think are really worth uh, mentioning. Back in 2008, she published a short story titled Bukan Yim. And the story was published in Jawa Post. And later on, the, the short story was one of the finalists of the 50 short stories. And it was later on published in an anthology yeah, by, by Compass uh, in 2009. And then it was later on translated into English and published in, sorry, I, I forgot to put it, uh, to put the, the link, but there is another, uh, another slide that can take you to, uh, to the link. So the translated version, maybe not Yim, was published as one example of uh, transnational literature yeah? in, in a website called Words Without uh, Borders. I should have put the, the word, the Words Without Borders in this slide, sorry about that. And just recently with the booming of podcast, at this short story, the especially the English version, maybe not Yim, has been turned into an, the audio version and released in at least two podcast channels that I know. Yeah, it, it's available uh, on Spotify. Uh, I could send you the link later on uh, through uh, the chat box. Another story that I think is also worth mentioning is Menjemput Takdir. Uh, this is one of the best stories that won Taiwan Literature Award for Migrants. Isn't this interesting? Taiwan has an award. It, Taiwan has a literature award exclusively for migrant workers. Yeah, not only from Indonesia, but also from the Philippines. This is uh, to show that Taiwan really uh, appreciates the creative um, activities uh, conducted by migrant workers. So. At this uh, short story is one of the finalists. Okay, let's take a look at, at this online self-presentation. In this case, how she presented herself as a writer on Facebook. Now, in this post uh, on the 2nd of July in 2020, she wrote about her writing journey, her writing trajectory. Yeah, so she referred to her old story that she wrote when, when she was still in um, Hong Kong. Yeah, and then uh, she also talked about the changing uh, platform of technology. In the second paragraph, we see that at that time there was no WhatsApp. We, we were still using SMS. We were still using Yahoo Messenger. Nobody uses Yahoo Messenger anymore, I think now. And the rest of the post is a short story. Yeah. So she has a, cup, a couple of posts like this in which she wanted uh, her friends 
her circle to read uh, her stories. Another, yeah, so this is the, the one that I just mentioned. This, this TV is not, is not this TV, yeah? this is not me, this is another TV uh, at the front. At the commented on uh, to show commented on uh, her friend Prativi's uh, attempt to change her story into an audio version on uh, Spotify in uh, the podcast. The this is the English version of the story, yeah. And she really appreciated uh, her friend uh, for doing this. And then another presentation is this. This is another podcast channel. Uh, and this one is the Indonesian version. Yeah? So if you look at this, this is the English version of the story changed into an audio version. And this is the Indonesian version, the original version changed into an audio uh, version also uh, in a podcast. Yeah? Hati, ini aku bacakan di sini karyamu ya. Uh, to me, as, as, as somebody who is really into literacy, this is also an example of how people are using read aloud yeah, to develop literacy uh, practices. And then now, this is the link that I mentioned earlier. Uh, in this post, Etty presented herself as a transnational writer. Yeah, this is uh, her reputation that not um, everybody can get. Yeah. So she said that she actually often uh, Googles her own name, but actually this is just a way to introduce her followers to this link, Indonesia Words Without Borders. If you look at, if you go to this link, you'll come across uh, famous uh, names, famous writers, uh, that are included in this link. And Etty is really, she, she actually mentioned that she was very fortunate to be part of this transnational uh, circle of writer, uh, especially considering herself as a domestic worker. Yeah? The other people have very high reputation. And she said, I'm just a domestic worker, but uh, my writing was included uh, here. So this is the link if you want to read the story. Another thing that she did in her writing, uh, in this case, not just the, the short story that she wrote, but also the post that she wrote to comment on her writings. Yeah? She wrote a lot about local cultures of the foreign countries, yeah. In this case, in this case, what I mean by local culture is Hong Kong culture, yeah. Uh, in this story, Nyonya Chu, she wrote about how some Hong Kong uh, Hong Kong people are still very superstitious, yeah. So uh, she wrote about uh, you know prophecy and also myth among uh, Hong Kong community. This is the, the post that, uh, that she had on uh, August the 8th when she won as one of the finalists of, for Taiwan Literature Award for Migrant 2020. If we look at what she wrote here, this is actually another interesting thing. Indonesia tahun ini menyumbang empat nama tahun kembar yang mengarahkan cahaya baik untuk pekerja Indonesia pekerja migran Indonesia menulis. So in my perspective, Ad Epi does not just present herself as a notable migrant writer, but she also placed herself as representing other domestic workers who have turned into writers. So in other words, writing for domestic workers is not just an individual activity, it's not just an individual practice, but it's a community of practice. It's a community of learners. Um, one striking thing that I observed from Ethics writing, yeah, many of Ethics writing is actually, um, you know, full of energy in a way that she wanted to write for humanity. Yeah? 
she wrote uh, to voice uh, her thoughts to fight uh, discrimination, to ask for uh, you know a balanced uh, treatment or better treatment for domestic workers. When she talked about writer's block, yeah, she said that if you want to write a good writer, if you want to produce a good writer, you have to be in an isolated part. You have to be discriminated. Yeah? You have to be alienated. Yeah? It, it really reminds us of great writers like Pramodya Anantatur or maybe Najib Mahfud. Yeah? Those people who were alienated and they produced uh, great writings. In many ways, Epi actually um, sort of copied uh, Ernest Hemingway yeah, because she really admired Ernest Hemingway in the way uh, she writes. So she mentioned that the writing activities during the pandemic is actually good for domestic workers yeah, because it's a way to heal the pain. Yeah? And also it's going to be good for uh, domestic workers' uh, future. Now, another thing that she did uh, on Facebook, aside from constructing her identity as a writer, she also used uh, she also uses Facebook for labor activism. Yeah, also through writing. For example, whenever there is a new regulation that she thinks is discriminating uh, towards migrant workers, and she's going to talk about this on Facebook. For example. There is this uh, program Prakerja, yeah? but then uh, in this uh, post, yeah, in this post, actually the Ministry of Manpower uh, already prepared to send new migrant workers to Taiwan and Hong Kong. To many domestic workers, it's actually quite a shame because Indonesia just does not want to stop uh, sending uh, women, those who are usually powerless yeah, to, to go overseas. This is another post. Uh, if we click here, she wrote a very long uh, writing, a long uh, piece of opinion uh, about this regulation. If, if you may not know about this, that migrant workers, especially domestic workers, when they work in Hong Kong, in Singapore, or also in many other sending countries, in the first 10 months, they cannot receive the payment. Yeah. So when they already start working, they are not allowed to receive the, the wage or the salary for the first 10 months. And usually the contract, the minimum contract is two years. So you could imagine 24 months uh, minus 10, that, that leaves only 14 months for them to actually receive the salary. The first uh, 10 month salary has to go to Agen, uh, Agen Pengiriman Tenaga Kerja. Yeah? It has to go to the agency uh, for the placement fee. Yeah? And to her and many other domestic workers, this is considered very uh, discriminating. Um, now, these are some uh, excerpts that I took uh, on the basis of my interview, my online interview with uh, Epi, when I asked her what is actually her motivation to work in Taiwan, especially with the bachelor's degree. She directly told me, do it, bu, do it, yeah, money, bu, money. Uh, I just translated it uh, for, for uh, our convenience. So the first issue that uh, sort of pushed her to, to go overseas to work as a domestic worker is of course uh, about the money. But then later on, she added that there is this drive to maintain the voice, yeah? She always wants to voice her thoughts uh, for social activism. So to me, I consider this as a kind of pull factor, yeah? So push factor, is a factor that pushes somebody to leave Indonesia to go overseas. Pull factor is something that attracts people to go overseas. So at the, the pull factor is 
she wants to know more about Taiwan because she's never been to Taiwan. Uh, she said, I have to know what is going on in Taiwan. It's not about being a tourist, yeah? It's more about knowing the activism there, knowing whether discrimination actually takes place so that she could write about that. Uh, so she said, do I sound like an activist then when, whenever I, I talk about uh, discrimination in Taiwan? That is what uh, she did in her writing. More about uh, her motivation to, to go to Hong Kong. Uh, this is actually intriguing, yeah, uh, considering she is already married uh, and she has a son. This is what uh, she said. She wanted to write, she wanted to avoid writer's block. I'm most comfortable whenever my son is with me and he takes everything. In other words, I can no longer write because I'm in my comfort zone. So when I'm in my comfort zone, I cannot write. My husband is more or less the same. He is very patient to hear my complaints. So I have nothing left to write. Tidak punya bahan to write. Yeah, that's why she decided to live in Indonesia and to work. She did not go back to Hong Kong, but then she, she found another country because she wanted to explore new things uh, in Taiwan. It's, in, it's interesting, but also it's, it's, it's really sad, yeah, because she wants to keep writing, but to be able to write uh, and, and voice her thoughts, she had to leave uh, her family. Uh, this is because according to her, nothing else matters whenever I'm with my son. What happened was that I always managed to find excuses not to write. When I'm in Indonesia, I'm just too comfortable. Yeah? And because being away from my son hurts so much, I can write about real things uh, and I need to release the, this negative energy. Yeah? It's, it's really sad to hear about this. But well, anyway, people people are, are different. People are unique in their literacy uh, practices. Now, uh, do I still have time? Yeah, I still have one more case uh, to discuss. Uh, please let me know if uh, yes, you I still have, have uh, problem. Uh, how much minutes? Ten minutes left. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that we do. Yeah. yeah. So everyone, this is the second uh, case that I have. My second uh, research participant, Mbak Wijiati Supari. Uh, she comes from Surabaya, uh, and just like Epi, in fact, she was also one of my research participants when I was doing my uh, PhD thesis. But I did not use the data. Uh, but I'm I'm. What can I say that? I'm still follow. I'm still, I'm still sort of uh, following her on Facebook, uh, and this is what I found uh, recently on her Facebook. So now uh, she is still in Hong Kong. Uh, the first time I met her was in 2013. At that time, uh, I remember very clearly in 2013 in January, I was with the members of Forum Blinkara Pena. Hong Kong branch on a Sunday morning uh, in uh, in winter in Hong Kong, which which was not really cold. Hong Kong, uh, sorry, Forum Lengkar Pena members in Hong Kong were having a discussion on creative writing. And since Mbak Wiji was a new member of FLP Hong Kong, one of the ways for orientation is to have her story reviewed, or if I could say scrutinized, yeah? It was really uh, critically reviewed by her friends, uh, the members of Forum Lingkar Pena Hong Kong. Most, if not all members of Forum Lingkar Pena Hong Kong are domestic workers. So that was back in 2013, but now she also works as a freelance journalist for Apa Kabar Plus, this is a local newspaper for Indonesians in Hong Kong, and many freelance journalists are also domestic workers. One very interesting thing about her is that she wrote the script and also directed a short movie titled Pulang, and this short movie 
won uh, a contest of short movie uh, held by the Indonesian consulate in Hong Kong uh, to uh, celebrate Hari Adiaksa ya, by Kejaksaan Republik uh, Indonesia. If we have done, we, will, we can take a look at the, uh, the video, maybe the first uh, three minutes. So let's see what um, Mbak Wiji has on her Facebook. Uh, this is one of the posts that uh, she had on just recently, uh, September the 6th. Look at the time. Tep tepat di ujung 0034, yeah. late uh, after midnight, they just finished a creative writing class. Yeah. If this is a kind of webinar and the members, most if not all members are domestic workers. Yeah, They are also conducting webinars like us. Yeah? They learn uh, to write. They are part of community of learners and they want to write not because they want to get good grades, but because they want to improve themselves. Yeah? They, they are writing for uh, self-advancement. Yeah, It's a class to write uh, short stories. If you notice the name, Ibu Naning Pranoto, uh, she is a lecturer and also a writer. Yes, so she is one of the mentors for domestic workers. This is about Wiji. Now, another self presentation. Yeah? This is one of the published works that Mbak Wiji has. Dua belas pena berbicara. Mbak Wiji is the one on the bottom left. Pojok yeah. kiri. That's Mbak Wiji. Uh, let's see how she tried to promote the work. Uh, the fact that she wrote about this. Yeah. So after the book, after the anthology was published, uh, domestic workers usually meet together on Sundays to Victoria Park, yeah, it's uh, the biggest uh, park in Hong Kong. So on Sundays, the park turns into Kampung Jawa. Yeah, no, if, if you go there, you, you wouldn't hear people speak in Cantonese. You would hear people speak uh, Javanese, uh, Bas Ngapa, and many other. Now, it's one reader of uh, the anthology. She saw this as a kind of self promotion yeah that she also has a fan bimbingan ibu dosen naning pranoto and so on and so forth sebuah karya 12 penulis lintas usia lintas negara yeah in, in many ways we can also consider this a kind of transnational uh, writing process now that's the current uh, project that she just finished the one that won the competition uh but Wiji, the one on the left is the leader of what they call ONCE production. ONCE actually stands for their names. One, C, uh, sorry, G, I don't remember, A, N, Z, but uh, th these are the, the members of the uh, their production house. They received the uh, Consulate General Republic Indonesia. They're preparing a project that was given by a company in Hong Kong. Yeah, so she has already become a short movie uh, director. Look at this. Um, that that is what some domestic workers do during their days off. They do not chat. They do not go gossiping, but they make movies. Yeah, as you see here, take lima belas. Yeah. If you look at these examples, uh, they are actually no different from college students. Yeah, they are also uh, engaged in many creative uh, process. Now, another good thing that personally um, I also need to learn from her. Yeah, she uses literacy not only to talk about literacy, not only to talk about the importance of writing but also to promote entrepreneurship. And uh, to many domestic workers, it's actually very important uh, considering that many domestic workers are still victimized by, uh, if you could say, 
fake investment, ya, investasi bodong, uh, they use uh, their money for consumption and then the money just uh, disappears. But Wiji has this business, yeah, this expedition business, and this business actually connects Indonesia and Hong Kong. She produces some uh, kinds of frozen food in her home in Sur Surabaya by asking her neighbors in Surabaya to cook and then to pack. And then she asked her husband to manage the business and also uh, send uh, the stuff to Hong Kong. Who are the clients? The clients are also fellow domestic workers in Hong Kong and also Taiwan. So this is her business, yeah? It's, it, it may sound like she's bragging, but she actually wants to promote entrepreneurship among domestic workers. Another uh, surprising thing, perhaps many of us are actually not playing uh, in stock trading, yeah, uh, penjualan saham. She is part of this stock trading activity, yeah. She has uh, stocks that she bought and also sold in the market, in the stock market, and she knows how to read stuff like this. I myself, I'm, I'm not familiar with uh, things like this, with this kind of uh, stock trading uh, stuff, but, but, uh, but Wiji continually promotes financial literacy among domestic workers. Yeah? So she talks about the position of uh, stock uh, for this company, yeah? Tiga Pilar Sejahtera Food. And she also uh, asks people to be aware whenever they buy uh, new stocks. These are some, uh, you know, some information that I received through uh, my interview with Mbak Wiji upon winning uh, the movie contest. This is what she said. I still remember when you came to Hong Kong, Butiwi, my story, the first story that she wrote, my story was scrutinized by my friends at FLP. That was back in 2013. I just learned what AE Day was about. Yeah? But now, yeah, she is one of the journalists for Apaka Barra Plus. Uh, in terms of movie making, I asked her about the creative process, but to my surprise, she actually said, I just go with the flow. Yeah? It was not like she wrote the storyboard, uh, she wrote the scenario, but she just uh, it just goes with the flow. I write and direct the short movies and then ask my friend to do the editing. But for her and her friends, the content is more important. It's, it was based on a true story. Pulang, the short movie, is about a domestic worker who becomes the victim of uh, high interest debts. Uh, high interest debts, yeah. Dapat utang. Um, uh, with very high interest. And she wanted to use the short movie to encourage domestic workers to stop uh, playing in uh, high interest uh, debt circle. A uh, couple of things that she told me about socialpreneurship, yeah? It's not just about selling things, Excuse but me. it's also, yeah. yeah. One yeah. minute probably? One minute. Yes, okay, okay. I'll, minute. I'll be done, okay. yeah, one minute. So uh, one thing uh, about her entrepreneurship is that she is doing it to help her neighbors, yeah, especially during the pandemic. I was often asked to cover events on entrepreneurship. Yeah, whenever she wrote for Apakabar Plus, usually it's about entrepreneurship events for domestic workers. So, so she, she really gets the mood. Yeah? She becomes one of the people also. I'm just trying to help my neighbors in Surabaya. My my uh, one in the brackets is actually my addition. Many of them lost their jobs to the pandemic. So the lady who prepares the food, yeah, the frozen food to be sent to Hong Kong is actually my son's caregiver, yeah, pengasuh anaknya. I post stuff about stock trading because many domestic workers are still victims of fake investment. So you see that. Uh, while Epi uses her writings for uh, labor activism, but Wiji uses Facebook for uh, social partnership. Right? It's also social activism. The last um, thing that I would like to mention is 
Um, I would call this a kind of literacy capital in the making, yeah, by using networking, by using her knowledge, by using uh, the pride and public recognition, she can actually produce money and the money later on also produces cultural capital. It, this is like a circle, yeah, it connects and also uh, influences uh, each other. If you want to know more, uh, I'm just going to skip this. If you want to know more about uh, epic writings, uh, I think that the committee will give you the slide later on. This is the link that can that will take you to her story, the English version, and this is also the link uh, if you want to read uh, epic writing, the one that won Taiwan Literature Award. I also have uh, my publication on domestic workers that was published in Culture and Religion by Ruth Ledge, Defining Islamic Modernity Through Creative Writing. This is another case of domestic workers that use writing to uh, you know, their Islamic identity. My, this one, doingliteracy.wordpress.com, is a blog entry from my blog, what I wrote about uh, Epi, and since we don't really have time, you could just go to the link if you want to see, if you want to watch the movie, yeah, Pulang. I think those are uh, what I would like to uh, share, Ma Udusia, thank you so much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for the insightful talk. Now we are going to have a Q&A session. I'd like to welcome any questions or comments pertaining to the talk on the chat room. Yeah, anyone, if you have any question regarding the topic, you can send it on the chat box. Okay, we have a question here. It's from Bu Evi. Okay. Hi, Bu Evi. It is a very interesting presentation on social construction of Indonesian workers' identities. This Indonesian workers are negotiating layers of identities that challenge the stereotypical image of Indonesian workers. Just wondering how their works in literature or cinema have been received in Indonesia? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. This is a very interesting uh, question, Bu Effie, and also really intriguing, especially the, the, the last, the last uh, sentence. How do or how have their works been received in Indonesia? Um, you know, I asked my friends from uh, Jurusan Bahasa dan Sastra Indonesia. In fact, not many of them are actually uh, familiar with uh, the works by domestic workers. Uh, what, what I could say uh, for now is that domestic workers' writings usually go around their own circles, yeah? Uh, not just circles of domestic workers in Hong Kong, but also uh, those in Taiwan and Saudi Arabia. They, you know, they read each other's uh, work. However, one interesting thing about when we talk about the reception of their work, actually they receive good reception from notable authors from Indonesia. For example, I remember that Pak Budi Dharma himself, he was the one who congratulated Epi uh, Juita for uh, publishing her short story in Jawa Pos, yeah? uh, uh, What's the title? Uh, Bukan Yem, yeah? Bukan Yem. Uh, if you read my blog, Epi actually received an SMS from Pak Budi Dharma at that time, Epi was still in Hong Kong. So uh, Pak Budi Dharma said something like this, but Epi, congratulations on having your short story published in Java Post. It's a really good piece of writing. Interestingly, Epi did not know about Pak Budi Dharma. So she turned to Pak Bonari. Pak Bonari uh, at that time was a writer and also a journalist who worked uh, for Java Post. And he was also a mentor. Uh, for uh, domestic workers. So Epi asked Pak Bonari, Pak Bon, who is Pak Budi Dharma? 
You see, in other words, um, domestic workers' writings actually uh, received good uh, responses by notable authors in Indonesia, but not really by, you know, by common people, uh, by, for example, by, by college students. Those who really want to know more about domestic workers and their writings are usually those who are conducting research. These domestic workers like Mega Christian, uh, Epsi also, they have been very good friends of uh, scholars from other countries, yeah, from Japan, from Hong Kong, and also from Taiwan, because they are really interested in knowing how these domestic workers against all odds are still able to manage their time to write and then publish their works. So uh, in, in other words, I have to say that they still have not received good responses uh, from common people, but among scholars, they are already well known. If, if I look at the, the, their Facebook uh, accounts, those who, are, who usually comment on their posts are uh, you know, scholars on domestic workers. Yeah, so uh, that's my uh, comment. Okay, thank you, Bu Pratiwi. Um, it seems that we don't have another question. So for the participants, if you have any question and want to ask Bu Pratiwi directly, you can raise your hand or turn on your microphone. So any question? Everyone is stunned by how impressive the presentation is. I saw in this chat box that, um, you know, people are recommending on how eye-opening this is. Apparently, um, maybe we can talk about, uh, what is it? Uh, can you comment, for example, mm -hmm. uh, you've been talking about the domestic workers in Hong Kong. Is there any similar movement with the domestic workers in the Middle East, for example? Okay, yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, and in fact, uh, there are a couple of um, social cultural factors yeah, that, that uh, influence or sort of um, encourage these women to, to write. When we talk about domestic workers in Hong Kong, especially, Hong Kong labor regulation is much more uh, friendly in a way that employers have to give them days off. Yeah, it's compulsory. If uh, if an employer asks uh, her or his domestic worker to to work overtime, for example, on Sunday, then they have they also have to give. Um, uh, what is it, extra salary, more like lembur yeah? on Sundays. Some employers uh, use Saturdays for the days off, but that is the rule in Hong Kong labor regulation. There has to be at least one day off uh, for domestic workers. And when they have their days off, they are free to engage in any social activities. One thing that they cannot do, one thing that they are not supposed to do uh, is to go trading, yeah, physical trading. For example, you have a book and then you sell the book to your friends. If you're caught, you might go into jail. Yeah. Uh, and that, in fact, th this is also one of the reasons why now there are, there, there are no more uh, suitcase libraries of Rupusaka and Lesehan on uh, Victoria Park. Uh, Prior to 2015 or 16, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you could find at least 20 perpustak uh, and 20 suitcase libraries. I use the term suitcase libraries because they put the books in suitcases and they display books on the mat, uh, on the floor along the uh, along uh, the, along Victoria Park. They are free to do this but they are not supposed to sell books, but they were actually caught, yeah? Some of them were caught selling books. So now Hong Kong authority uh, prohibits uh, domestic workers to engage in this 
actually noble activity. Uh, so the compensation is that now Forum Lingkarpena, uh, Forum Lingkarpena has a suitcase library also. So Forum Lingkarpena suitcase library has been given a space in the office of Kantor Kejak, uh, in the office of uh, KJRI Hong Kong. Yeah, and it's also near uh, Victoria Park, which is really a good thing. Yeah, because the, the office is now uh, open to everybody on Sundays. Yeah. Oh yeah, I haven't I haven't actually mentioned uh, why can why can't this thing happen in Saudi Arabia? Uh, basically, it's because Saudi Arabia does not have a similar regulation in Taiwan. It's not really compulsory for employers to give days off, but it's more like encouragement. They are encouraged to give days off. And the fact that there is um, you know, a literature award for migrants, it, it, this is also uh, an evidence that uh, Taiwan Authority gives appreciation to uh, the involvement of, of domestic workers uh, in Taiwan. But it, things like this, do not exist in Saudi Arabia. It may, we may see some examples in Singapore, but not in Malaysia. So three countries that are relatively more friendly for domestic workers to engage in creative uh, you know, activities. Uh, they are Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Singapore, but not in other mm -hmm. countries, especially Saudi Arabia and, and Malaysia, unfortunately. Oh, that's very interesting, yeah. Budiwi. Thank yeah. you very much. We can we can discuss about this more. Before. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, everyone is so stunned. But I guess there is a, a chat yeah. Um, yeah. or a question in the chat box. Mm. Yeah, I think there is a question from Nadia here. If I if I'm allowed to respond to this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. May I? Uh, yeah. Yes. From, we Nadia. have another question here. Yeah. Finally, uh, it's from Nadia Karima Maula. Are there any other activities or work that Indonesian workers also pursue other than writing? Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Yeah, so the answer is yes. In fact, uh, if, if, you, if you have a chance to go to uh, Hong Kong and then we go to Victoria Park on Sundays, it says on Sundays, the uh, Victoria Park turns into Kampung Jawa, a Javanese village. And practically every corner yeah, is uh, occupied by domestic workers, uh, particular communities doing different things. A couple of activities that I think I can mention, because there are a lot, of course, community of writers, community of uh, you know, pengajian, diba'an, community of hip hop dances, uh, it's there too. A community of um, handcrafting, prakarya, there are several circles there. A community of uh, the, yeah, suitcase libraries, but, but that was before the government prohibited uh, them to, to do that. A blogging also. So there is also a community of uh, bloggers there. When I was uh, conducting my research, I actually uh, made sort of an appointment to meet the community of bloggers, but they thought I came there because I wanted to talk to suitcase library operators. Yeah? So I went to uh, one corner of suitcase library and I was like, okay, Budiwi, we are ready to listen to you. I said, no, I'm not going to speak about anything. I'm just going to listen to you. So they thought I came there to talk about writing. But we ended up talking about so many things. Yeah, we discussed uh, blogging. We discussed uh, suitcase libraries. So I should say that this community, especially literacy-related activities, they are, uh, you know, they are, connect they are interconnected. Um, I can actually say that suitcase libraries serve as a hub, yeah, seperti colokan. Uh, there is a hub, and once there is suitcase library, then you can always uh, find a community of bloggers there. You can always find a community of writers there. So these are very closely knit um, uh, circles. Uh, but other than writings, as I mentioned, 
handcrafting is there music theater also yeah because but Wiji is also part of theater you know theater uh, Hong Kong uh, also by migrant workers do they perform yes they do perform especially during uh, special occasions yeah um, 17 Hari Kartini they perform theaters they perform poetry reading they also conduct a poetry reading contest story writing contest who are the judges the judges are also fellow domestic workers so they are extra extraordinary women yeah sometimes i remember talking about things like this to my students they feel like i'm, I'm so ashamed i'm a college student and i don't even write i don't even have a blog uh, in in a, in a literacy theory, we call this literacy shaming. You are ashamed because you don't do this kind of literacy as compared to domestic workers who may not have enough time to to do things like this. Yeah, yeah. So sorry, everyone. I'm I'm always excited whenever I talk about literacy, but I think it's because it's it's my passion. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Bupra TV, and we have Richard Pine. Thank you for your amazing talk and answers. And I'd like to invite all the participants to give a round of applause to our speaker today by clicking the break sense button. Okay, thank you. Okay, last but not least, I'd like to invite all the part participants to follow our social media as stated in the chat room for more information regarding our upcoming events. Yep, session one of Reels 2020 today is done. Thank you for your active participation. Before we enter the second session, I or Saya Mayoriska signing off. And after this, we will have ice breaking session with Payogi. So have fun, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Bupra TV. Yeah.